And good afternoon and welcome back for another episode of Thursdays with Charlie. It's number 64 and it's the 12th of August, 2021. Well, obviously, I am back from a wonderful trip to the Ark Encounter. I'm definitely going to tell you a lot about that, both on the Thursday show and over the coming weekend. It was a really, really awesome experience. What I'd like to do is give you a quick rundown of the whole trip. Began on Tuesday of last week. Deacon Richard kindly drove me up to Henderson and in the afternoon, and I spent the afternoon and the evening with my friend John Rodolini, who was down here in May to do a show. So having an evening out with a magician was really fun for me and a great way to start the trip. John and I stayed up talking magic and doing a little shopping around in Vegas, and it was a good start to the adventure. The next day, I went to airport bright and early in the morning. John got me there about 6 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday. I was flying Southwest Airlines, and I managed to get through everything. It was amazing. I was wondering about with my eyesight, would I be able to handle, you know, getting through the airport, finding the gate, uh, getting the baggage tagged and all of that. I was able to do that with, with really no problems over there. When I got to TSA... I managed to get through okay. They were kind of uh, like, well, put your pass face down over here, and I just couldn't tell which side was face down or face up on it, but I, I got through it anyway, and they didn't even make me take my shoes off, so I guess I look 75 uh, no matter what. That was kind of neat. Uh, one of the things I found out was a lot of people are traveling. All of the flights except for one, and I had four flights total, uh, were overbooked. I could have made $600. They were offering a free flight plus $600 in Southwest credit if you'd give up your seat. Well, I didn't want to give up my seat because I wanted to get on the adventure to the Ark, so I didn't do it, but I could have made money on it. And I love Southwest for many reasons. One, they give you a free luggage uh, so you can take with it. You could take your luggage with you without having to pay for it. But they also make the pre-flight announcements somewhat fun. I always like listening to them. And I think they're designed to make you listen to them because they try to do them fun. Like for instance, when the stewardess was explaining the oxygen mask, she said, and in case of an emergency, the oxygen mask will come down from the ceiling Please grab one and remove your face mask and place it over your nose and mouth and breathe normally. If you're traveling with children, please place the mask on your own face first and then help your husband or boyfriend. Uh, they definitely had a good sense of humor. Refreshments were limited. Uh, you were, uh, the refreshments consisted of either Coke, Diet Coke, water, or coffee. And since they had trouble understanding talking through mass, they had a sign which had a picture of a Coke can, a Diet Coke can, a glass of water, and a cup of coffee. And you were supposed to point to the one you wanted, and that's the one they would bring you for the flight. My first flight went uh, from Las Vegas to Midway Airport outside Chicago. We got to Chicago and was supposed to have a quick layover. I got to the new gate and then we're supposed to fly from there to Cincinnati. Uh, and we ended up having a plane, but no crew. The crew had gotten stranded on another flight waiting to arrive there. So we sat for about a half an hour hoping that uh, the crew would arrive and that we'd be able to get on our way. And we did. Flew into Cincinnati, and I was picked up at the airport for the half-hour drive down to Williamstown, Kentucky. Now, it ended up that we were going to be a group of eight people. Uh, which is kind of interesting because there were eight people on the ark, according to the Bible. So we were our own group of eight. So Tom and Miranda, who are parishioners of ours out here in Laughlin, and their friends uh, Terrence and Mandel. And then there was another couple, Jason and Priscilla, who uh, Jason is the son of Carrie, who's the aunt of Miranda, uh, and uh, then I was there. So we ended up being a group of eight, four guys and four girls, and we were ready for the adventure of a lifetime getting to see the ark. 
We arrived at the motel. They had driven out in a camper. Uh, Jason and Priscilla drove up from North Carolina in their car. Uh, I flew in and Carrie flew in from Palm Springs. I flew in from Las Vegas and we were all meeting up at the motel. Motel was right next to the Ark. There was not a piece of property between us and the Ark. It was couldn't have been any more convenient. And the motel was owned by a, a really nice Indian family from India uh, rather than the American Indian. Uh, and they all pitched in. I mean, there was one working at the desk, some people doing the cleaning. They had a nice continental breakfast. Uh, the rooms were beautiful. And we were right next to the Ark, which was really, really great. And the first night we were there, we got it, everyone arrived, and the restaurant on the property happened to be a Mexican restaurant. And that was kind of interesting. Here I am in Kentucky, and I'm about to eat Mexican food when I'm out in the southwest over here. But it was beautifully decorated. Each of the chairs was carefully painted. It had a really nice vibe to the whole place. Really enjoyed it. <clears throat> And so for my first meal in Kentucky, I chose to have a fried shrimp chimichanga. One of the people looked and said, but that's all deep fried. I said, I know, and that's why it's going to be really good. And it was. It was actually an excellent, excellent meal. And I had fried ice cream for dessert, another little treat for the starting the trip. Next morning, bright and early, we had our continental breakfast at 8 a.m. And then we headed over to the Ark for 9 a.m. And heading over was like driving to the next piece of property. It was really, really easy. You park the car in a beautiful lot. And they had a bus that picked up. There were buses that were running continually to take you from the parking area to the actual area where the Ark is located. The buses were magnificent. Matter of fact, I don't think I've seen nicer tour buses anywhere in my existence than they had for just this passage from the parking lot to the Ark. And we got there, and the first thing we did after we got our tickets and uh, got our wristbands and everything to go, they had a virtual reality sort of ride. You got into this conveyance, and you put these goggles on, and you went through a 15-minute experience where it was totally involved in the building of the ark, but also a trip back in time to what it might have been like for the original ark and the original flood. And it was really amazing, complete with, uh, you know, some wind in your face, a little bit of water here and there. And it, it made you feel like you were actually getting ready to experience the flood. That was our, our first uh, experience with it. And then we got, they had a concert. They're doing what they called 40 Days and 40 Nights of Gospel Music. And so there were several concerts during the day. And I kind of expected that it would be like a simple, you know, almost like being at an amusement park or a theme park. And maybe a 15 or 20 minute concert. The concert went for a couple of hours. Uh, and it included a prayer service even during it. And the gospel groups were amazing. Uh, the two groups we heard at the first uh, concert were the Williamson family, and the other group was Triumphant Quartet, apparently very, very well known in the gospel music circuit. I had not heard of, of either one of them. And the theater that we went in for this was a hall that was designed to seat 1,500 people. We haven't even gotten to the Ark yet. We're still in the administration building starting out. 1,500 seat theater to experience this gospel music. And it was really well done. Uh, the Williamsons did about a 45 minute set. Uh, and then there was a, a little prayer service. And then the Triumphant Quartet did about a 45 minute set. And they had some wonderful music. One of the songs that really got me was, a call, it was called Going There. Uh, and it was done by the Triumphant Quartet. There was a screen that had to have been 40 feet long and 20 or 30 feet high in the backdrop. And the words were right up on the screen. In fact, they were so big, the words, that even with my eyesight, I could see the words on the screen. And 1,500 people sitting in this auditorium 
we all sang along. I mean, I presume some of the people were familiar with the group and, and knew the melody, but after a while, we all kind of caught on, and, and people were standing up, and people were waving their hands, and people were singing. It was an absolutely wonderful time. Uh, the words to this song, I'm not going to do all the words to going there, but I'd like to at least just give you the, the verse, the, the I'm sorry, the refrain, the chorus that we sang, because by the time we got through it, we pretty well knew this. <clears throat> it's a song about going to heaven, and, and your plan is, that's what I want to do in life. I'm going there. I'm not a citizen just of here. I'm a citizen of heaven, and that's where I'm heading. And by the time you got through the song, you were ready. You were just ready to go. And the, the refrain goes, I'm going there where the streets are made with gold, where the milk and honey flow will never grow old in a land beyond compare. I'm going there where the lamb will be the light. No more pain and no more night. It'll be all right in the place that God prepared. I'm going there. Imagine singing that with 1,500 people, various points standing up, sitting down, raising your hands, and going back over that refrain while the lights are flashing on this huge screen behind the quartet. It was an amazing experience, uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, and they did a little prayer service, actually quite quite nicely done. I have to admit, as a preacher myself, I kind of rate prayer services when I see somebody else doing them, and I was kind of proud of the way this guy did the prayer service there. Well, when that was done, uh, we decided to head over uh, and have a bite of lunch. Um, the lunch was at the Timbers restaurant. It's right next to the Ark, and we had a full buffet. It was as if we were back in the days way pre-COVID, no masks in Kentucky, it's a free state, and we got to enjoy the buffet, and boy, it was delicious. I mean, this was not a, a buffet made from frozen food somewhere. There were people actually preparing these meals and putting them out. Absolutely wonderful. I think my favorite part of it uh, was the vanilla pudding. It was really, really good. Uh, having had three servings of it for dessert, I know it was really, really good, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> now, we still haven't gotten onto the ark. We're walking around the grounds. We're enjoying the scenery, beautiful gardens. We get to the ark. The ark is this huge structure. It's over 500 feet long, built to biblical proportions of cubits, over 500 feet long, over 85 feet wide, over 50 feet high. And we got on there, and the first thing we noticed is there were three decks. And so what we did is we took the elevator. Now, there wasn't an elevator on the original Ark, I'm sure, but I'd, I thought it made sense. Let's go up to the third deck, tour the third deck, and then we'll walk down to the second deck and then down to the first deck so we wouldn't be climbing up. Beautifully done, the Ark and, and the replica that we were on. And the first thing we noticed up on the third deck is they had the living quarters for the people. Now, according to the Bible, there were eight people on the ark. Noah and his wife, and Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. Now, it was interesting because one of the questions that I had was, well, what were the names of these wives? And the Bible doesn't give us any names for the wives. They give us Noah's name, and they give us his son's name, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So we looked around and we were trying to figure out the names of the wives. And one of the things that came up was there are so many ideas for what the wives were named. Uh, they're not given in the Bible. They're taken from various traditions down through the years. Uh, and there's actually a, a little booklet that was written, and I'm not making this up. It's called The 103 names of Noah's wife. Maybe there aren't a full 103, but there sure were a lot of ones. So I kind of tried to settle on a, on a list from one portion of tradition uh, so I could get, at least in my mind, the names. <clears throat> the ones I chose were Noah's wife 
was Nama, N-A-A-M-A-H, Nama. That seemed to be a very common name in many of the traditions for the wife of Noah. And Shem's wife was Salib. Shem's wife was Salib. And Ham's wife was Nahab, Nahab. And Japheth's wife was Arbasisha, Arbasisha. These people, according to the biblical tradition, there were eight people on the ark, and after the flood it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and then they remained on the ark until the waters dried up. It's estimated that that was about 110 days from the start of the flood until they were off the ark. So 110 days on the ark with all of those animals is what the Bible portrays. And so on the upper deck of the ark, uh, we got to see uh, the living quarters. I mean, again, the Bible is not giving us this description. It gave us the size of the ark. But the ark was fitted out at this ark encounter so that you could visualize, well, this is where Noah and his wife lived for those 110 days. This is where Shem and his wife and Ham and his wife and Japheth and, and his wife lived. It was really amazing uh, on the first deck. We took a break and we went to see the zoo, which was also on the property there. The man who built the Ark Encounter was from Australia. Uh, is <clears throat> and as a result, one of the featured animals in the zoo were kangaroos. But even the zoo was unusual and really nicely constructed. Uh, there were not cages, except for some of the animals, but for the bulk of the zoo, you actually walked along a concrete path and there was grass next to you. You were told you don't go on the grass and the animals were kind of, didn't go on the pavement. Sometimes the kangaroos and other animals would walk up to you and you could touch them, but you would just see them out in the open. It was really a, a nice experience. As you came down, we went back on the ark and we came, came back down to the second deck. There were other places where the animals were stored. There were cages or pens. And when you went down all the way to the third deck, the third deck had things like uh, storage for water, jugs of water, a uh, grain, foodstuffs, and, and things like that. Also, again, because this is a recreation, there were various points on the ark. I mean, they had bathrooms, should you need that uh, along the way. But they also had various theaters which showed some of the events. You could relive the flood if you wanted in one of the theaters. Another one was set up. It did an interview with Noah. Uh, you had to visualize, it was kind of taken out of its time frame, but as if there were a gossip paper, like one of the tabloids interviewing Noah, and there was this reporter, it was done in a movie form, and it really, really well done, and she was there taking notes, and Noah was trying to build the ark, and she said, well, who told you to do this, to build this, this ship? He said, it's not a ship, it's an ark, and God told me to do this. And she's writing, she says, God told you to build the ark. Well, did God give you a set of plans? Noah said, no, we just said how big it should be. And I'm trying to design it right now and to go, oh, and God told you to do this. Yes, God told me to do this. It was a really creative uh, interview and very, very enjoyable to watch. And I could actually, you know, see something like that happening if it had been uh, there. We got to see uh, a lot of things about the, the whole uh, experience and we enjoyed it very, very much. Again, we took pictures. Uh, there were places you could put your face through a, 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 a cutout of Noah. So I have a picture of me as Noah, which I'll, I'll eventually show you when I get some copies made of that. At any rate, we walked. I think I must have walked about five or six miles that day, more than I have walked in years. We were very tired. We didn't get back to the motel until after five or six o'clock at night. Um, after we had such a big buffet lunch at the uh, Timbers restaurant, all we wanted was a little simple supper. So we went back to the Mexican restaurant on the hotel and we uh, had our uh, a smaller dinner that night. 
The next morning, uh, we got up, we drove over to a Waffle House. We had the Continental breakfast, but then there was a Waffle House nearby. And I, I haven't been in a Waffle House in 20 years. It was amazing. I had this huge bowl of grits which was amazing. I love grits anyway. A little bit of butter on them, and they're so good. And had a waffle and some scrambled egg whites. It was really good. And of course, some really crisp strips of bacon. It was really, really a nice breakfast. Then we drove on. 45 minutes away from the Ark uh, is the Creation Museum, built by the same man who built the Ark, uh, an Australian. Uh, this was a story, uh, a museum designed to put the story of creation to life. And so you're walking through this huge building. There's various places where you can see films or interactive displays and things like that. Uh, they had a recreation of what they, they put, portrayed as the Garden of Eden. And I think that was my favorite part of the museum. You're walking through, and it was this garden area, and you had these figures representing Adam and Eve, and it was just really, really well done. They also had a lot of little displays showing why creation makes sense, how God would have done the creation over a period of time. <clears throat> and then we got to this huge movie theater, and it was going to be a movie, The Story of Creation. So I went in with a couple of the other people from our group. Jason and Priscilla went with me there. And we sat down. I tell you, the chairs in this movie theater were so unbelievably comfortable. And it was a 3D. Actually, I think they said it was a 4D movie. So we put these goggles on. And we're sitting in these really comfortable chairs, and the screen comes on. I remember the first day of creation. God said, let there be light. The next thing I remember, Jason and Priscilla are waking me up, saying, it's over, we have to leave. Thank goodness I know the biblical story of creation, otherwise I would have missed out on it entirely. But it was so relaxing and so beautiful there. We had a great time, spent hours at the Creation Museum. I would go back to the Ark in a heartbeat to see any of those displays. The people were so nice. The families were there, people with their children. A lot of just nice, friendly people out for not only a good time, but a religiously good time. They were expressing their faith by being there, and I, I think that came through every, every day. When we left uh, the Creation Museum, we found out that in the area, the same area, um, Kentucky is known for bourbon a particularly American whiskey, I found out. And so we went to the Boone Distillery, a bourbon a distillery not right near where the Ark and the Creation Museum are. Got there and we went for a tasting, a tasting of bourbon. Now, I don't think in my life I have ever had any bourbon. So we got there, we go into the tasting room, and they have a, a mat set out in front of us and all these little cups of uh, bourbon of various types. And the woman giving the lecture or the, the tasting lecture uh, started off with, you know, this is 130 proof. And she says, you don't want to chug this. You want to just let a little bit get on your tongue and savor it. I let a little bit get on my tongue, and then I didn't want any more from the shot class. It really did not appeal to me at all. We went through a couple of others. One had a citrus background, and the citrus part was nice, but it had such a kick after it. I really didn't enjoy that. The fourth one down had a little bit of a cream flavor. That was the only shot glass that I actually finished. It was okay but still very, very strong. Uh, fortunately, they gave us some pretzels and a glass of water uh, to have. But I did get to try some Kentucky bourbon uh, in Kentucky. One of the things I learned uh, was that bourbon is an American whiskey. Uh, apparently, the term bourbon can only be used 
for this form of whiskey made in America. It can't be used in other, other countries. So there is no French bourbon or German bourbon. It's an American thing. After we left the distillery there, we went back to the motel, freshened up a little bit. We went out to Cracker Barrel for dinner. So we're definitely getting to hit all the high spots in, in my food thing. And again, it was so nice. There's no mask requirements. Food was plentiful. People were fun. It was a great, great experience. Now, the last morning before I flew home on Saturday, there were several thrift stores in the area. And we decided, at least some of us, the, the four women and me and Terrence, that we're going to go and we're going to go see some of these trip stores. Uh, basically, there were four women with cell phones trying to give us directions how to get to these various thrift stores. Terrence was driving and trying to listen to whoever was nearest or loudest to him. And we somehow got to several of these trip, trip stores. And we had a great time over there. All in all, seeing the ark, hearing the concert, the music, getting to these wonderful restaurants, going to the Creation Museum, um, actually getting to see the bourbon distillery. It was a wonderful several days in the great state of Kentucky. And so I really enjoyed it. And I'll probably be talking about various aspects of it for a long, long time to come. I did get a few souvenirs. My original plan was I wanted to buy a pair of owls at the Ark. Two by two for the Ark. I forgot to get a pair of owls. They were all sold out of the owls. So I said, all right, I won't get a pair of owls. So we started rummaging through in the various little gift shop areas, and we did find an owl wristband. Uh, I think this was actually made for a child. Uh, but it's a really little cute owl that you can have on your wrist, a snowy owl, spotted snowy owl. So I got that for one of my souvenirs. And then I said, well, I should get an animal. Well, they had no stuffed owls for me to bring back. Uh, I said, well, penguin, I'll get a penguin. They had no stuffed penguins. So I settled for an armadillo. I'm going to name him either Arnie or Tank. I'm not sure which. He's a really cute little fella. I didn't buy a pair because I, I couldn't justify having two armadillos, but I did get my armadillo on the ark, so I'm very grateful for that. And then I got from the tasting of the Boone County Distillery, got a little shot glass to remind us that we were there tasting bourbon, and that was enjoyable. And at the thrift stores that we visited, uh, the people who went with me to them, they got me this sort of Hawaiian shirt. And so someday I'll wear that and I'll get to enjoy uh, that little thing and remember the trip. And the last souvenir, um, the people who were driving the camper, Tom and Miranda, they picked up a, an ironwood owl in New Mexico. And so I am coming back with a, a wooden owl. It was a wonderful adventure. If you ever have an opportunity to go to the Ark Encounter, I strongly recommend it. You will enjoy it. You will have fun. You will hear great music. You'll eat great food. You'll be with great people. And it'll be an awesome time. That's about it till Sunday. I'll probably tell you more about it on Sunday at the sermons. By the way, speaking of sermons, I want to thank Father Jim Jankowski for being here last week. And if he hadn't been here, I wouldn't have been able to go. So I'm really grateful that he was able to be with you for the weekend. Now this weekend coming up, Sunday is the 15th of August. It's the celebration of the Assumption of Mary. So many things in, in Mary's life parallel things in Jesus' life. When Jesus had risen from the dead, uh, he ascended into heaven of his own power, the power of God. Mary, since she's not God, she's very, very close to God. She's the mother of God, we regard her. Uh, Mary was assumed, she was taken up to heaven by God's power. Now, this is not mentioned in the Bible, but it's been a Catholic tradition since the very, very beginning. And there's a couple of things that uh, kind of make it believable and uh, for all of us down through the ages. Uh, some of the Eastern churches don't even call it the Assumption of Mary. They speak of the Dormition, 
the falling asleep of Mary. And they said that, well, because Mary was preserved free from original sin, that's the Immaculate Conception, and death is a consequence of sin, that it makes sense that Mary should not have died, that when her earthly life was completed, her dormition falling asleep, that she would be taken up bodily to heaven. In kind of corroboration of that, the early church was very, very interested in having relics. And so there's either things connected or even bodily bones or, or fragments or, or clothing connected with many of the apostles that people have revered down through the centuries. There are no such relics of Mary. There's no one that says, oh, I have a piece of the clothing that Mary wore or, or this is you know one of the strands of her hair or anything. There's nothing like that. So Mary's body, we really don't believe, is here on earth. There are two sites that are regarded as the tombs of Mary. Uh, One is near Jerusalem, and the other is in Ephesus, because there's a tradition that Mary, after the death of Jesus and the resurrection, went to live in Ephesus. Neither tomb has ever had any body in it. No one has said, well, this is where Mary's body was. It's just the place where they remembered her passing, her dormition, her going to sleep. And so those two places are are still places of pilgrimage, uh, but there's no connection with Mary's body ever being there. However, it wasn't until November the 1st, 1950, many, many years after Mary's life on earth, uh, that the Pope at the time, Pope Pius XII, actually made a, a definition and said, it is part of Catholic faith, it is part of Catholic belief that Mary was assumed, was taken up into heaven, body and soul. And that's where we get the, the feast of the Assumption of Mary. He decreed that on November 1st, 1950, and so the first time it was celebrated was August 15th, 1951. So this weekend will be the 70th time we have celebrated the feast or the solemnity of the Assumption of Mary. It's one of the great Marian feasts. Of course, for us who are here in Laughlin, it has a special meaning because on this date, the 15th of August, in 1992, our little parish was founded as the mission of St. John the Baptist. So we're 29 years old this weekend. We were founded as a mission. We became a parish in 2009. As I've always done since I've been here, I just quickly go over the priests who I've served here over the years. Of course, you're familiar with our, our two deacons, Deacon Dan and Deacon Richard. Uh, Father Joe had served here over the years uh, helping. But the priests who have been assigned here are Father John McShane, who was our founding priest. He was here in Laughlin from the beginning, 1992, until 1996. He was followed by Father Kevin McAuliffe, and Kevin was here for just under a year, from 1996 until 1997. It was Father Kevin who moved us from the Laughlin River Lodge, or at that time was Samstown Gold River, to the Riverside. We went to the Riverside under Father Kevin in 1996. Father Peter Romeo followed. He was here from 1997 till 1999. Father Peter worked at uh, the tribunal, the marriage tribunal for the diocese, and was assigned here in Laughlin for those two years. Father Peter is the only one of the priests who have served here in Laughlin who has died. The rest are, are still alive. Father Peter was sir, was followed by Father Ray Schultz. Father Ray Schultz was here from 1999 till 2001. Again, about two years uh, in there. He was a priest from the Diocese of Bellevue in Illinois, and he has gone back to Illinois after he served here, and he has since retired, but still living in, in Illinois. He was followed by Father Frank Inserto. Father Frank was here from 2001 till 2008, and it was under Father Frank's leadership that the church was built in 2003. 
And I came in 2008, and I'm still here. So I've completed 13 years here, and I'm in my 14th year with you, and I hope that lasts a long, long time. And I can uh, look back and say, well, the Garces Center, our new building, went up during my time with you. We're very, very glad, and I've had a wonderful time, and I'm continuing to have a wonderful time with you, and I get to tell you all about it in our Thursday shows. Just going to make one comment quickly. In, the, in our 25th anniversary in 2017, we produced these wonderful hardcover books with pictures of our parish, of our parishioners. We still have some of these left, so I'll make sure they're available at the church and at the Riverside this weekend. If anybody is interested, they're $5 each. We'd be very glad to have it. I don't know if we're going to do another one for our 30th anniversary next year. We might. We may very well think of doing that. That's about it. My Gark Encounter experience, my experience with the Creation Museum, with the Bourbon Distillery, a little bit about the Assumption Celebration, and our parish history. Tell you more about some of those things over the weekend. Now time for Pasco to come on down. I loved that song that we sang at the Ark Encounter, I'm Going There. And so I checked in in Latin, that would be, Ebi ego iturus est, I'm going there. So maybe keep that in mind. This is not our real home. Heaven is our real home. That's where we're going. Ebi ego iturus est. Have a wonderful time. Mm -hmm.